Blessings, everyone, and thank you for joining me. And um, I'm really happy to get to speak with um, today Raymond Vincent. He, he's an iconographer, and I've gotten to know him um, through social media on, on Facebook specifically. And I've uh, talked to a couple of times a friend of mine, Shane Swenson, who's also an iconographer. You can look back and see those episodes. And I, I actually I also met him on on social media uh, as well so today i'm i'm really happy to um actually meet raymond for the first time well at least at least face to face so thanks thanks for joining me raymond yeah thanks for having me so you're an iconographer but you also uh you're a writer as well so i i i had read one of your and you suggested it to me too um but could you could you give a little bit of of your background, like um, um, you know how you got interested in iconography? Um, are you are you Orthodox um, by birth? I'm not even sure about. I think you were raised Catholic, weren't you? Roman Catholic. Yeah, I was, okay. I was raised sort of nominally Catholic. My family were were Catholic, but really it was more of a, a cultural sort of ethnic kind of thing um so it it wasn't uh, too central and then in high school i kind of fell in with the evangelical christian crowd and i was you know did that for a while until reading myself back into catholicism uh reading the church fathers and then i read myself into the the christian east so i was actually an eastern catholic for um about 12 years before officially converting to orthodoxy uh, two years ago. What, yeah. what ethnicity are you? What was that? What ethnicity are you? You said it's, you were kind of ethnic Catholic. What? 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 My family were from um, uh, Portuguese colonial Africa. Oh, cool! So all over Africa, but the Portuguese speaking. Yeah. yeah so that's... we always say we're Portuguese, but you know, not from Portugal. Okay. Yeah, that's very Catholic with with the apparitions of Fatima and Portugal. Yeah. And yeah, it's a, it's a, I don't know what it is today, but traditionally, yeah, it's been a, a Catholic, Catholic country. Um, so how did, how, how did you get like introduced to Orthodoxy, Eastern Orthodoxy? Did you read a book or, or did you know yeah. somebody or? I didn't really know anyone at first. Um, the evangelical community that I was part of, a lot of people converted to uh, Catholicism and Orthodoxy at the same time. And this was like 15 years ago because we were all reading the Church Fathers and things like that. So it, it was sort of on my radar, but it was really, you know, when I started studying theology academically. So I have two degrees in theology, um, just reading the Church Fathers. And I got very into a Roman Catholic theologian, Hans Urs von Balthasar. Oh, yeah, I heard him. Yeah, he really introduced me to the Church Fathers, particularly Maximus the Confessor and, yeah. and Dionysus. And then once I got into that, it was, you know, it was just inevitable that I would, <laughs> I, I became Eastern Catholic because at the time that was a way to like be Orthodox, but still kind of have this sort of Catholic identity. Um, and it just a lot of books, um, you know, Vladimir Lasky's famous book, The Mystical Theology of the Eastern Church was... Um, something really influential to me but it was it was a much more theological uh, a theological route into orthodoxy not not necessarily liturgical which i know a lot of roman catholics who convert to orthodoxy it's it's because of liturgy but for me it's more it's more theology that's cool yeah. no no before uh you became orthodox were you an artist or interested in art or, or anything like that or no that so when I was an evangelical, there wasn't really any visual arts, you know, I mean, there, there are some evangelical visual artists, but it wasn't, you know, part of that tradition. So I was a musician, so I play cello and I sing, and um, I was in a worship band and all that kind of stuff. And when I converted to Catholicism and just had sort of an Eastern church, you know, in my in my world, I mean, it was out there somewhere and iconography was out there. I just dove, dove into it, started teaching myself iconography. And oh. fortunately, because my, my degrees were humanity degrees, it mean, it meant I get, I got to spend a few years 
at school just focusing on fine art and music before going on to study theology. So I use that as my way to um, just train myself as an artist to to do iconography. But actually, I was more interested in sacred music at first than it wasn't until slowly that, you know, the iconography aspect kind of took mm. over my my emphasis rather than music. Mm. I'm curious, wh why were you studying theology? Did you want to teach it or you, th you think about being a priest or a minister or anything like that? So originally, when I was in evangelical, I was very involved in ministry, um, doing youth counseling, running internships and things like that. So I worked for a ministry for a few years and I was uh, basically planning to be a pastor. So when I converted to Catholicism, uh, you know, there was still in, in Roman Catholicism, there's a lot of like lay involvement. So I was planning to just be like a lay minister. Um, so I went that route as as a catechist, was formally trained as a catechist, and then just got my BA and my MA. But when I became an Eastern Catholic, uh, that turned into more of a, a vocational kind of uh, trajectory. So, so were you thinking about being a priest, a, a, a union priest? A, a priest? Yes. Yeah, that, that was basically the idea. Oh, yeah. cool. Cool. So after my master's, I did a little work in seminary, uh, but then I converted to orthodoxy. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. And 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 you're married with a fam, and you have a family. Yeah, so I'm married, and I have five kids, five daughters. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. You're Actually, outnumbered. Yeah, my wife was one of my interns in the evangelical ministry, so we got married right when I was converting. So she's been along, you know, for the for the ride. <laughs> Yeah. So, so what, what, when you married, you were, what, what faith were you or what, what, what religion were you or? So we, we got married in the Catholic church. So it was still like, we spent a few years in the Roman Catholic church before like making a decision to go into the Eastern world. So we were married. Yeah. In the Roman, in the Roman church right there in uh, the cathedral of Sacramento. Oh yeah. I know it very well. Oh yeah. Wow. That was our, that was our parish church. Yeah. Oh yeah, right, right downtown. It's 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 a it's a pretty church. It's nice. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. Now, um, I kind of wanted to talk to you. Cause I don't get to talk to people about art a lot, yeah. except uh, of course Shane I did, and then um, Anthony Visco I did a pretty long um, art deep dive into art, but this. This this article that you wrote is called Culture and Community Creation as Orthodox Evangelization. Yeah, sorry about the long academic ease title, but yes. <laughs> oh, no, it's okay. At least you know what it's about. And it's not specifically yeah. about art, but mm. when I was reading it, that like kept coming to my to my mind. And I have a when I get real serious about an article, I you know I print it out. I don't read it online, and then yeah. you know I start I start um, uh, highlighting with the yellow marker. Yeah. I, I know. <laughs> so this is really this is the first paragraph. So I, I'm gonna I'm just gonna read little parts of it, but I want people to read it. Oh, and what I'll do I always say this in every podcast. What I'll do is I'll put the link to this article in the, the video description. Yeah. So Raymond wrote, consciously or otherwise, our age yearns for a vision of what it means to be authentically human. Our culture seems to offer only cheap, hollow, dispensable, and ideologically possessed identities that fall short of satisfying the desire of the human heart. What the world offer, offers only exasperates this sense of listless unfulfillment. Really like that. So what I think, I mean, see what my mind always goes to visuals, mm. but I think, I think visually, you know, there isn't really any sort of art form that's fulfilling to us, even in terms of religious art anymore. It's quite hollow. So, I mean, that's, that's where, but, but of course, theologically, that's true because I've, I've written and I've spoken a lot about and used the word identities, which is cool. Is it, 
people have this, um, I sound like a broken record all the time. People have this um, empty space in their soul that only God can fill. Like a, like St. Augustine talked about, you know, I'm, I'm restless till I rest with thee. But And they try to fill it with all this other stuff. And we're seeing that now with, you know, gender, sexual, all these different identities. And it never, it it doesn't, it doesn't fill that. It just actually, it just makes the, the emptiness, like you said, just, it becomes limitless. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, to kind of uh, link that to art, one of the things that a lot of, uh, uh, I would say modern artists, but contemporary artists. Um, really, art has been so cheapened just because it's massively available. So uh, artists like to talk about like the the democratization of art, where you know it's just really easy to access and inexpensive. And what that's done is basically made a disposable forms of art. So it's really just cheap you know, it, it's really cheap input and output. So I, I think part of what's going on in the arts, but also in the general culture is because we have this disposable culture, it means we're constantly cycling through anything that's going to not just tickle our fancy. Um, and it's not just novelty. It's, you know, we're, we're really disconnected, I think, from deeper roots, from deeper aesthetic experience. So we need to constantly, you know, feed in junk food aesthetics is how I like to think of it, but that's actually good for business, you know, because if I can mass produce, you know, junk food art, like crappy music, like, you know, pop music that's designed to basically carry, you know, on a radio wave or designed to be downloaded. And you're really appealing to the bottom, you know, the, you know, basic, this is going to appeal to the most people, this rhythm, this beat is what my algorithms say is going to you know, be really catchy, these three chords are what people can understand. When you dumb down everything just so you can mass produce it, it it's great for business because you constantly get consumers. You're not going to get someone who, you know, puts on the same album over and over and over again because they want to really juice every single note or, you know, find something they haven't heard before. We don't really produce art or culture that has any kind of depth. And that's part of that, that you know, capitalist instinct, and I'm not like an anti, you know, capitalist, but I think some critiques of capitalism are really good, that we're constantly uh, producing consumers of aesthetic experience that don't allow for that experience to go very deep. And what that turns into is we now have the ability to sell people identities through aesthetic experience, through art, through culture, to where you could basically buy the identity that you want to sort of put on, but you can always just take it off because it's really, it, it doesn't go very deep and you're, you're constantly cycling through these new identities, uh, new consumer identities. And that's, that's sort of now part of our culture and we can't really, or I, I, I shouldn't say we can't, it's just very hard to escape that. So that's what I was kind of getting at is we, we're in, this like oversaturated aesthetics. We constantly have music and visual stimulus and film, but it doesn't really go deep because it's not designed to. So even though we have like a excess of quantity, it's the qualitative difference that's really, you know, causing the the spirit it's part of the spiritual starvation. Yeah. Wow. I like that. You wrote this too. Christ came to destroy death and with it its power of disintegration, mm -hmm. alienation, fragmentation. That I really, I thought was cool because it, it I, I like the words disintegration, alienation, fragmentation, because it seems like, especially in this age with people being interconnected mm -hmm. through, through technology, that people should not experience those things of, you know, being fragmented or alienated, but it, it seems like the more there's the appearance of interconnection, the more fragmented people, people feel. No, I, I, I think that's exactly right. So if we look at, you know, what, 
death is death is disintegration i mean we can even look at philosophically it's the soul leaving the body and then the body starts to break down and what was a composite starts to decompose so we're the spirit of death is inherently it's a spirit of decomposition it breaks down our relationships well the first primary relationship it breaks down is our relationship with God, uh, you know, that's what happens uh, to our first parents when they fall, that fragments, and then their relationships with each other fragment, and then their relationships with their body fragment, uh, and you, they need to cover themselves because now they're not, you know, a subject, they're an object of lust. So what I see is the spirit of death, basically, it it's it's a spirit of entropy, it just breaks down everything that it touches. And I, I think in our day, we have, like you said, an illusion of interconnectivity, an illusion of integration, but it's really not because we can't really piece all of these pieces of our life together. Like I was just talking to a, a friend of mine um, who who is not even a friend of mine, like I know him purely online and I've tried to take the steps to actually like call him up and, you know, Zoom chat and things like that because we're always interacting you know, online, but we were just talking about that. Like, you know, if, if I only have a social existence, it feels like I'm connected. Like I have all these friends from all over the world. I have information all at my fingertips, but that is that really integrated into my life? Am I really developing, you know, relationships with these people? Uh, does this information, is it local? Like, does it affect how I live day to day or ought it to affect how I live today, day to day? So I think, um, like you said, we do have this illusion of mass integration, but what I really believe it's doing is actually disembodying and disintegrating us. It's like the more we get plugged into the simulation of integration, the more sort of atomized and broken up we get. And then it's harder to kind of develop real life, you know, in, in the real world. So, you know, I'm not, uh, I was just uh, talking to the buddy I was, I was just uh, referencing, you know, I'm not, a Luddite. I'm not, you know, I'm perpetually online. You probably see me all the time on, on Facebook and things like that. Um, but I try to make sure that it's always like a tool that I'm not, I'm not the product. It's not my attention that is being sold that I'm actually using these platforms to connect with interesting people. And I, I do try to do what I can to make sure to integrate those relationships as much as I can, even though, you know, a lot of my online friends are on the other side of the country. Um, and I think that that same sort of societal disintegration is happening on a massive scale. It's because our culture is completely, you know, it's moving towards being completely online, completely disembodied. Um, it's, it's, it's exactly that. It's a simulation of a wholeness that isn't really there because it's not really integrating the whole human person. It's only this, you know, this para sociality that we live, you know, through through wires and, you know, Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's, it's a very tricky thing. But it, it, this even happened before the internet, just the, as soon as you get a, a mass culture that's deracinated or really doesn't have any roots, um, this sort of societal disintegration starts to happen. And you see it first, I, I believe, in art. And then you start seeing the same things that happen in art happen in, uh, in the different institutions, you know, politics, education, and then finally gets into family life and just humans themselves start to like mimic or, or manifest the same symptoms that art, you know, did a few generations earlier. Um, yeah. The, the, yeah, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. And then the thing the kind of the takeaway that I was getting from this article, your article was um christian culture i mean in terms of of an aesthetic like principle is there one but but then i also started thinking about is, is there any kind of unifying culture and i thought just in the western america in particular and the only thing that i could come up with is like celebrity culture is the only mm -hmm. thing that really you, you know unifies us I guess it could be sports, but but sports. I, I don't know if if it's if it's all encompassing. Like 
like celebrity culture is good. And then, and then you wrote this, the work of the gospel is both personally transformative and has a culturally healing and generative dynam dynamism. And that got me thinking again about, I mean, does a Christian culture in the West exist anymore? I mean, I would say no. Yeah, I, er <laughs> no, go ahead. <laughs> go, go, go ahead. No, I, I would say no. I would say no as well. Um, I, I think we live in... I, so a lot of times I hear people call what we're experiencing now is like a return to paganism and things like that. But I, I really don't think it is like my, really, no, hmm. no, no. My comeback is like, if only we actually were returning to paganism because paganism, you can baptize. Um, it's still operating in a misguided way. It, according to some of those like hardwired sort of natural law where it's, it's reaching out for the gospel. But Neil, Neil, now, nihilism, because you mentioned nihilism here. You yeah, nihilism. Okay. Yeah. So, so a lot of this goes back to um, the existential philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, who's really important in my own work. And what Nietzsche talked about is that the West, over over several centuries, for a variety of reasons in several different ways, has basically had killed God. And what happens when you kill God, you don't revert back to a paganism. You don't revert back to, uh, you know, a world that still has metaphysics, metaphysics, a world that still has, you know, heavenly powers and natural laws. You actually move into a post-Christian world where Christianity had already killed off paganism. But once you kill off Christianity, there's really nothing to replace it. Uh, and that's what uh, Nietzsche basically called nihilism, which was, you know, this great nothingness that he predicted would destroy uh, Western civilization. And I think uh, he predicted it, it very, very accurately. So that's where I see us now as we're, uh, you know, in this post-Christian kind of culture, which in, in my opinion is actually much, it's more dangerous. We've never really experienced this before. And it, it's really hard um, to go back, <laughs> to go backwards. Um, I agree. So I, I, yeah, I, I forget what what led to that uh, little rant about uh, post Christianity. Well, I I was saying is is there a Christian culture? And and you oh, said I said no, and you said no. no. So so the funny thing is is I I I think it is a, a distinctively post Christian culture. So we still have some of the scaffolding of Christianity. It's just been you know the deity has been taken out of it. So, like, if you ask your, you know, non-Christian secularist where they get ideas like, you know, universal human justice and rights or, or you know, why should we prefer this, you know, inequity? Why is that wrong? Why is this correct? They don't really have any answers. Um, and I think it's because we still have the leftovers of a secularized version of Christianity that came out of uh, particularly American Protestantism or English speaking Protestantism that put all of its, you know, eggs in the basket of morality. But once you take the deity from that, all you have is an aimless morality that it can just find new causes and virtue signals, but it can't, it, you know, it doesn't have any metaphysical answers. So I think, you know, we don't live in a Christian culture, but we do live in something very odd, which is a, a post-Christian culture that still has some of that scaffolding. But like I said, it, and it no longer has a deity and it no longer has clear answers. It only has, you know, what's left of, of morality, but it can't actually say what's right and wrong. So it's uh, that morality gets real tricky. Yeah. You, you wrote every aspect of Christian culture, which engenders our ecclesial life, is the product of sacred tradition, that organic process wherein the faith is handed down in full to each subsequent generation, and by which the spirit-guided church navigates her temporal sojourn. And, and I, th I thought that was interesting because that tradition that sacred tradition isn't handed down anymore. I mean, I guess it sort of still 
persists in like Orthodox Judaism with with you know boys in their bar mitzvah where they have to learn I guess the Torah but mm. I mean I can't I, I you know I don't know in in main mainline Christianity I don't it seems to get watered down and diffused with each generation like you were talking about just being culturally Catholic I mean that's kind of the space that that I grew up in too it was kind of like well you know I was born that way and you know I was born Catholic so it's just kind of something I do occasionally like on Eastern Christmas mm. whereas my dad growing up in Sicily it was mm. a very it was a very Christian infused yeah. culture you know it was he was born in a backwater which is different from the city but i mean even within our lifetime those sort of cultures existed and then it it kind of went down real quick <laughs> you know, so. yeah I, part of what i get into that article and this might be a helpful frame to understand it is you know so much of what the gospel did uh, we're used to, as you know, Americanized people, we're used to a very almost Protestantized understanding of the gospel. Of this, you know, you hear a message, you have a personal conversion, and you have these certain like metaphysical commitments. I believe in this and that, and you know, um, which that is part of conversion. Um, but you know, everyone who's baptized, you know, in in the year, you know, five hundred. Um, or maybe a little further in the year 800, they still had to be a convert to the faith. Even at their baptism, they were still converting to the faith. But the difference between, you know, that and what we experience today is that the gospel really did transform the culture at, at, at its very foundations. It transformed the Roman Empire and turned it into Christendom. And I think that that world, that civilization that was Christianized disappeared so rapidly that we're not really used to, because we haven't been in this situation for, you know, 1800 years, we're not really used to doing Christianity or passing on the tradition in a context where that tradition is not um, mutually enforced by the general culture. Uh, so you mentioned like the difference between, you know, growing up in the States as a Roman Catholic between growing up in Sicily. Uh, Sicily's probably, uh, changed from when your dad was growing oh, up. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, and yeah. now now it's probably much more similar to the states, but you still have that cultural reinforcement of of Christian or of the Christian worldview being, you know, more or less the norm, whereas in the United States we didn't have that. So, you know, like I'll just use my family's example. They came from a world that was just steeped in Catholicism. Uh you didn't really have to explicitly pass on these traditions uh it, and they did pass on the traditions that the feast days and the devotions um you know all of that was maintained but what was missing is they didn't transfer the worldview because the tr the worldview was already supplied by the culture itself and when you get to a situation of the united states where you know it's secularized but it also has very all kinds of different worldviews at play i think traditional christianity had a really hard time uh, making that transfer happen because it didn't have any kind of reinforcement so like my grandparents were very devout but their kids you know weren't at all and uh, of the, the the grandchildren i think myself and like maybe my brother are the only ones who actually practice any kind of Christianity, particularly cr traditional Christianity. So it was not knowing how to make that, um, to pass on that tradition because it wasn't reinforced by the general culture. And you brought up, you know, Judaism. Uh, that That's an interesting case because Judaism has basically learned to subsist as a subculture. And I, I think that really is the future of Christianity uh, in the West, in the United States, is to kind of getting comfortable being, you know, a subculture to where we do have these sort of enclaves where we can pass down our worldview. So it's not all on the, um, bur it's not all the burden of the parents. You do have, you know, a social network that can actually reinforce what you're doing at home. But that's going to be a huge mental jump that I, I don't know that we have made yet, or we're we're making. We're not really making well. 
I want to talk because you mentioned that later on. I want to bring it up. Mm. Um, you wrote this here. It is small wonder so many feel so failed by their culture and have busied themselves in tearing it down. And mm. I, I, I think that's interesting because like 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 you said, I think a, a sort of false culture has been sold to people. And because there's a, a vacuum, you you buy it. And I because I don't think you can just blame like pop pop culture for filling that void because mm. organized religion did step back or did um bend to the world. So of course something's gonna fill that. And you know the secular culture, you know, saw saw an opening and went right through it. People bought that, thinking that it would give them a sense of fulfillment. It hasn't. And when you're disappointed like that, you're angry. So I yeah. thought that was a good point. That I mean, if I'm interpreting you, you correctly. But... No, no, that that's exactly correct. So it, I, I should probably back up. Um... You know, when I'm when I'm talking about culture, I am talking about the artifacts of culture, like the music, the art, the architecture, the literature. But that's really just what's on the surface. It's that whole worldview that's underneath. And what all traditional cultures do in human life is they basically give us morality. And morality doesn't just mean like right and wrong. It basically says these are the things that you're supposed to value. These are the guide rails to make sure you don't screw your life up too, you know, dramatically. And this is the basic direction you need to go. So pursue these things. These are the things that we we set in highest value. So we can organize ourselves and organize our lives around uh, a way to actually live meaningfully. That's what cultures do. And when cultures break down is they actually don't provide any longer those signposts and those guide rails for people to kind of successfully go about being human. So they walk around dazed and confused, you know, meaningless, which is what Nietzsche was talking about, because they had no guiding star. They had no sense of gravity, um, how Nietzsche talks about it. And that can breed a lot of different things. One thing that means people are starving for meaning, starving for um, a way to focus themselves and focus their moral priorities and, and give their life sort of a central organizing idea. And that's what our culture sells a lot of is, you know, you discover this new identity and all of a sudden the world makes sense and you can see all the bad things that ever happened to you as manifesting in this or that, you know, form of oppression. And then you have a moral cause. It gives us this instantaneous way to kind of crystallize our lives that our culture in general and per particularly Christianity stopped giving because it wasn't really in the culture. But uh, the two things that happen, and this is a uh, uh, part of what Nietzsche was getting at and other philosophers is that one, you get people who feel atomized, who are, who are not really served by the culture. So they're aimless and they start turning into just mindless consumers, what Nietzsche would call last men. And, you know, so when, when people are starving, um, you know, junk food is still food. So, you know, I don't, if the only thing meaningful in someone's life is the next Marvel movie or, you know, <laughs> the Star Wars saga, giving them their moral framework or whatever. I don't, I don't necessarily critique them because when you're starving food, I mean, food is foodie, even if it's junk food. Um, so that's one thing that happens. And Nietzsche would call those the last men. But another thing that happens is you start realizing you're, you're not being served by your culture. Your culture really isn't doing what it's designed to do. And you feel like you're failed by your culture. And that's what Nietzsche would call resentiment, where you have this buildup of resentment to where now your instinct is just to tear everything down because you don't really perceive that you have a future. Because you don't know what your life means, you don't know where you're going, you don't have a direction, you don't have a future, the future disappears, and everything, um, you know, everything can be torn down. And you really get this in a lot of our... Um, you know, ideological movements, particularly Marxism, uh, this is like hardwired into Marxism, uh, is that, you know, all we have to do is tear down the society and then miraculously somehow, you know, this utopia is going to appear. No one really knows how, but we know, at least according to Marxist theory, that all you have to do is tear down uh, systems of oppression, to, if whether it's economic 
social, and then now we've moved those systems uh, of oppression to culture itself, where we have to dismantle Western culture, and then miraculously something you know will spring forth that will give everyone meaning and direction, and it's just um, it's just more and more nihilism. Like there's no there's no bottom to the disintegration. Yeah, we're yeah. I, th- that's theological. I can follow it to a degree, but yeah, it's stretching. It's stretching me intellectually. But thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> now, where you know where I've kind of seen secular culture or pop culture kind of start to disintegrate is that in in the past, let's say before the nineteen sixties, um, mm-hmm. let's just say like actors had a very controlled um public image yeah um with with the advent of social media you know people talk a lot more and uh, and are heard a lot more so you know these these people that have become like icons in in um especially in the west you know reality stars pop singers actors you know um they're asked they're asked to give their opinion on a variety of things and not that these people are dumb but i mean they're primarily you know entertainers so unless there's something like personal going on in their life there's not they don't really have much that's interesting to say and i i so i think you've seen a bit of falling away and then I think connected to that is the rise of I, I think people have 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 instinctively realized that. And so you have the rise of these online thinkers like George. I mean, the one that I always think of is like Jordan Peterson, because he's an intellectual. People could argue that, but he's also a celebrity now. So you've I've seen a lot, especially young men shifting towards that sort of um milieu which they find more fulfilling so yeah no i think what happened to actors is an interesting interesting thing so back in the 60s it was actually um in the contracts of these different actors where they they weren't allowed to talk about their personal life like that was completely completely separate um it, you know that was hardwired into the industry and i really the reason this actually goes all the way back to plato and i'll just get uh, philosophical for a second um plato famously in his ideal republic he banished all dramatists he banished all you know uh, people who wrote plays about the gods and everything else uh, and the reason he said is because you know if this is who we're presenting to young people to idealize and their lives are a moral disaster it, it's just going to cause moral disaster um so that that sort of idea that who we we idolize who we idealize maybe idolize is the wrong word but some people do idolize that we were very protective once to make sure that only one message was being presented. The movies always kind of had a moral twist. Uh, bad lifestyles weren't really celebrated. These actors, as we know now, now that everything's like, you know, memoirs and everything, we know they their personal lives were a disaster. But you never saw that. That wasn't, you know, projected. Even like, um, you know, uh, political uh, celebrities like the Kennedys. You know, all you saw was the good, shiny exterior and i i think you know as deceptive as that was it, it was a moral protection to where the more we started to see the inner lives of these people the more um we were like wow that's a disaster but then those are still the people we idolize and try to model our lives around where today it, it, you know it's just expected that as celebrities you're going to have to know everything about their life they're going to be perpetually online they're going to tell you what they think about everything. And there's only a handful of celebrities that don't do that. Uh, the only one that comes to mind is like Keanu Reeves, you know, <laughs> like everyone else is going to tell you, you know, it, all of their personal business. But we used to be much more careful about that because we understood it did have an effect. And, you know, that really started to shift in the 80s 
to where, you know, this idea that this, uh, the personal lives of celebrities was going to be harmful to people was poo-pooed. That's just, you know, slippery slope fallacy. That's just, you know, hysterical evangelical Christians. And then here we are, you know, 30 years later, and it turns out, you know, the slippery slope <laughs> wasn't a fallacy. Like, we're, we're here. Oh, you know, we are here. We're at, we're at the bottom of the hill. Um, we're, we're at the bottom of the hill. So we see people like Jordan Peterson, even though his own you know, problems have been very, he's tried to be personal about them, but it, 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 everyone saw it, you know, you know, his, his sort of decline in personal issues, but I still think he gives a moral message that, you know, young men in particular really aren't getting anywhere else. And that's why, you know, I, I believe he's been such a uh, phenomenon and now like a, a celebrity intellectual. There's, there is substance there. I mean, people can argue the quality of the substance, mm -hmm. but there is there is substance. Um, this is really important to you. And, and I hadn't really thought about it recently, but you brought it back up to my mind. You said conversion is a communal process, impossible for the lone Christian. Um, I always think of parallels, and I always think of the feeble replacements of religion, because that's kind of been a, a pet project of mine. But you see that in niche subcultures. Um, let's, the, the people, whether it's, you know, sexual orientation, you know, gender or, or psychedelics or drugs, within the pseudo-religious um, communities, there's initiation, there's some sort of redemption mm -hmm. and there's a, certainly a certain type of discourse that takes place in these communities that yeah. are very religious like so yeah. again it's a substitute so people i think do sense i mean i think it's always humanly um it's built in to i think the human experience that that people long for the transcendent but they also long for a community of believers that share in their faith. And that can get real weird. I mean, we know that in cults, but it can just, the, I think there are very many cult-like um, niches in society that have grown up that I don't think people see as cults. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, they definitely are. Like, uh, we're used to thinking of cults or religions um, with, like, deities, even though they might even be strange deities or weird ideas. But what we're seeing now is the first, like, post-theological post cults springing up is really what they are, because they do give people some kind of transcendent, you know, framework to operate out of, and they do, you know, fulfill this social need. Um, even though it's, it's very unhealthy, like I, I know a lot of people who've gotten into, you know, what I would maybe term as like identity cults. That's, that's the reason why they do it ultimately is because it gives them, you know, a social identity and a community and, and a way to feel like they belong to something or some other, you know, humans that they're really not, you know, not getting anywhere else. Yeah. And I, and I think the point of your article too, before I move on to one other thing is that, you know, including orthodoxy, religions need, need to do a better job mm. of, of reaching out to people because um, that's why so many get get trapped in these these weird matrixes of of uh, pop culture, cultish, niche, fetish, weird online identity you know, webs. So yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Matt, if you don't mind, let me see. I'm going to do a share screen here. Let's see. Yeah. Boom. Okay. Can you see that, Raymond? Yes. All right. Let's hope these okay. are in order. I, I kind of wanted to take a deep dive real quick in, sure. in art with you. And your article is what um, got me thinking about it, mm. about a Christian culture, yeah. so to say, um, where, where Christianity had a culture, mm -hmm. 
where it went off the track, where it still exists. Is mm -hmm. it possible to get one, you know, to manifest one again? Mm -hmm. So this is uh, a, a Roman fresco. Um, don't ask me the period. But I mean, I picked this because here you're seeing the cultural space where Christianity, uh, you know, first began to create an, an aesthetic. Yeah. Um, and you'll see this sort of imagery in, in icons, right? So. Absolutely. So um, what I often point people to it so this is a, a fresco from i believe it's like from pompeii or herculaneum and we know that it's from like the 70s ad i forget ex exactly when the the mountain erupted so within that you know time frame this was was painted but this is the world in which christianity and a distinctive christian culture emerged and what's you know fascinating is i can look at this fresco i'm looking at the strokes made in the garments i'm looking at how the faces are highlighted this is still the same technology that i use so it, it, it's it's kind of amazing like you could look at these ancient roman frescoes and immediately understand oh this is where icons come from <laughs> you know um even how the people are making eye contact this is you know all the same technique as we still use in iconography. So when we talk about, you know, Christian culture, it's important to understand that Christian culture didn't emerge, you know, out of nothing. It really did take roots and transformed the entire classical world and turn the classical world into the vehicle of, of Christianity's own, you know, life in the world. And you can see that just very viscerally when you look at uh, particularly uh, Roman, Greco-Roman uh, painting and fresco like this. Yep, yep, I agree. Um, this is a catacomb painting. I can't remember where a catacomb mm -hmm. of Calix, Calix, Calix. Mm -hmm. Um, This is uh, the Good Shepherd. Mm -hmm. You can still see Roman influence here, but it it looks like it's kind of going in a different direction. So, yeah. So this is an interesting example because. Um, we have the same image, the same Good Shepherd image in purely pagan Roman context as well. So the only reason we know sometimes whether this Good Shepherd is the god of the, the flocks or uh, a symbol of Christ is because it's accompanied by other Christian symbols. Mm -hmm. So earlier scholars used to point to this and, and say, oh, you know, the early Christians were synchronous. They were just kind of meshing these things together. But that, that's not really what what was going on what was going on is christians you know if you're a christian and you uh have property and you build a tomb for your christian community uh you know how many people in that community are going to know how to paint you're going to go have to hire someone and say hey can you paint a good shepherd and he's going to go sure and he's going to paint it just like he's painted every other good shepherd he's ever painted but to you it means christ um so that's part of how this process of christianization happened is they used the the even the the symbols and the visual imagery that were already in the culture and started giving them a distinctive christian meaning and that whole process took um at least a couple centuries before it, it was where christianity itself was supplying the the, the prototypes for the imagery so yes. this is like right at the the cusp of that transition this is probably painted in the early 300s i agree that's awesome oh gosh i can't remember this but this is also a catacomb painting yeah, yeah. so so yeah now and but this is so very early on that mm -hmm. now you see what we would think of as a traditional imagery mm -hmm. of christ emerging so it's not something you know new it actually goes way back yeah. to the early you know christian martyrs where they had what a, a basic sort of blueprint for what Christ looked like that we'll later, later see in, in iconography. So. Yeah, so this is, you know, uh, probably a generation after that, that good shepherd. And this is distinctively Christian, but all the elements are still Roman. 
like what Christ is wearing is the garb of a philosopher. And that little stripe was a stripe worn on the, the toga of the emperors and anyone connected to the Senate. So this is like a regal iconography, but this very quickly became the standard iconography of Christ. But even having Christ bearded didn't really become the absolute norm until the sixth century. Um, but this is uh, probably late 300s, 400s. But here we have the Alpha, the Omega, which is, you know, a clear reference uh, to Christ. But even the halo, you know, is a Greco-Roman convention. So we interpret it as a Christian symbol, but that was already yeah. in Greco-Roman art um, for, for centuries before it was really clearly uh, associated with Christianity. Yep. This is Saint um, Saint Cath Saint Catherine's Monastery in. Always correct me if I'm I'm wrong. Saint Catherine's yeah. Monastery in the Sinai, which was I've always wanted to go there, but it's an interesting place because very much a backwater. So uh, uh, you know, during a lot of warfare and, and times of turmoil, of course, things in in Rome and Constantinople, of course, were destroyed, but a lot of the St. Catherine's Monastery is such a treasure trove because there's a lot of things that were preserved there. So, I mean, here we're seeing, again, very early on, uh, an iconography that is recognizable to, you know, e uh, Eastern Orthodox Christians. So. Yeah, no, this, this is fantastic. So this mosaic was original to the church that was built in at St. Catherine's Monastery, which was actually funded by the Emperor Justinian. So this is contemporary with uh, the, the mosaics in Ravenna, Italy, and also contemporary with the building of Hagia Sophia. Um, and this is actually an unusual depiction to have in a church apse. Um, and the reason why this is here is because it was site-specific. Um, it, Moses, you know, had his experience, we believe mystically he was, you know, seeing Christ in the future on the mountain when he saw God in the form of a man. So that's why this is here. And there's an interesting thing that happened in Christian sacred art, the, why we can look at this and instantly know, oh, it's the transfiguration. This is like the normal transfiguration scene. Well, there was a time when this wasn't the normal transfiguration scene, when no one knew what the normal transfiguration scene was. And basically what happened is that first sort of flowering of sacred art, particularly um, in between Emperor Justinian and iconoclasm, which was only, you know, about a hundred years, a little over a hundred years, there was such a massive building campaigns in all these holy sites. And in each holy site, they would depict the things that happened there. And you started getting pilgrims who would take back these imageries back home, back to Constantinople or, or back through the Mediterranean world. And that's what actually standardized how we depict certain scenes in iconography. It was this period. And it was pr predominantly pilgrims taking taking these images back home. Like if you went to a pilgrimage site, they would have this scene depicted on a little clay seal that you could take home as a, um, as a pilgrim souvenir. And that's what really standardized the iconography to where, you know, over a millennium later, this is just a normal quote unquote uh, transfiguration scene. So it's quite, quite amazing what happened in, in the fifth or uh, in uh, from the sixth uh, century onwards. I love that. Uh, this is also some from St. Catherine's Monastery. Mm -hmm. So it's a very, very early depiction mm -hmm. of the Our Lady, um, the Theotokos. But we're all, again, we're all, I, I guess I'm beating a dead horse here. Again, we're seeing uh, um, a certain um, blueprint for how mm -hmm. these depictions are, are, are painted or written. Mm -hmm. So very, very early on. So it's, it's, um, iconography and and uh this uh christian aesthetics are very you know very ancient mm -hmm. yeah yeah a lot of these come from saint catherine's yeah here's yep yeah so i mean this i thought this was very very um, cool because if you go back to that that um um fresco in the catacombs i mean we're seeing a certain uh, lineage here that's very direct. Yeah. No, the, the, the continuity is is all there. So this is the famous Pantocrator from Sinai. 
And it, scholars believe this was donated to the monastery by Justinian himself. So there's another wing that has St. Peter, and we think the other wing had St. Paul, but it, it no longer exists. So this was most likely painted in Constantinople, in Byzantium, which is why it's so, you know, exceptionally high quality. And because, as you were saying, it was out in the middle of nowhere, it was mostly the icons from St. Catherine's Monastery that survived the iconoclasm. So we really, you know, that's why we have a lot of these masterpieces of the, you know, the, 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 the wellspring of Christian cultures because no imperial troop is going to go out there and like break any, <laughs> destroy any icons. Thank God for those monks. Yes. Here's this the is, um, gosh, and I've been there. This is in Sicily. It's the Monreale. I think so. Yeah. I get, I get that one or Shafalu confused. I think this is Monreale. So in Sic Sicily is, is very cool place. Not just yeah. because my my um, heritage is there, but it had a very strong Byzantine influence. Mm -hmm. And again, because Sicily was not necessarily Rome, Constantinople, you know, Jerusalem, things mm -hmm. tended to be preserved there. And yeah. we have some absolutely incredible mosaics there. And this, but this is the West. So you yeah. can see how this iconography was not just localized to the Eastern Empire, but no, no. It, it was in the way. And of course, Ravenna too has a lot of, of, of yeah. these type of things preserved. So. Yeah. Interestingly enough, and I, I'll, I'll get to this in a second, it, um, the West had more or less the same artistic tradition as the East until the Italian Renaissance, where it very consciously went in a different direction. And we know that from, uh, oh goodness, I always forget his name, the guy who invented art history. Um, we know that because that's what the Renaissance masters said they were doing. They trained under Greek masters. Oh, Vasari? And, Vasari? Giorgio yeah, Vasari? Yes, yes, yes. Vasari talks about that with Cimabui, who trained under a Greek master and basically took it in a completely different direction and kind of culminated or disintegrated, however you want to look at it, with, um, you know, with Raphael. And then you get into mannerism and all that other stuff. But so, yeah, we do see a, a very unified Christian artistic culture. So this is in Sicily, but this was, you know, you have to remember Sicily was part of uh, Magna Gratia. It was part of this greater Greek sort of zone of the Mediterranean, of, of Calabria and southern Italy and uh, all over, all up um, the east coast of Italy, really. So these were all Greek-speaking Christians, and that didn't change in 12, until the 1200s. This was actually, I, I believe, built around the 1200s. I could be somewhat wrong in that, but this no, is I when think the you're right. 12th century. Yeah, uh, I think you're yeah. right. Yeah, this is when the Normans took over Sicily. But the Normans who took it over, you, you also have to remember the Normans were, were were Vikings, and the Vikings were also in Constantinople and were hired basically the, by the emperor to be his personal guard. So there was a lot of contact between. Um, uh, Norman Sicily and uh, Byzantium. So it became super fashionable to import Greek mosaicists over from Constantinople to decorate these um, Norman uh, regal churches in Sicily. So you'll see this all over Sicily. And you even see some of this in Rome, like San Clements in Rome was also uh, decorated by uh, Greek artists. And I believe the Domo in Florence at least started off being decorated by by Greek artists or, or Greek mosaicists. So this was hugely, hugely popular and didn't really fall out of favor until the Italian Renaissance. Yeah. And and I have to say, because I've, I've been there personally, these, and and even though I experienced these, these artworks in, well, liturgical, they're also religious works mm. of art. I, I experienced them within it a more or less secular setting where I, I didn't experience them in a liturgical <clears throat> atmosphere. They mm. lose something, I have to say, in photographs because they are full sensory experiences. They are really impressive when you see the way the light plays on that gold and it's, yeah. it's pretty incredible. <laughs> You know, I, I always tell people like, you know, museums are where sacred art go to die. Like, you know, when you when you decontextualize and they do lose something and just a little bit about, you know, the, the how it plays on the light. Um, 
the Byzantine craftsmen, the craftsmen, the mosaicists, actually figured out it, it was part of the technique where they would put the tiles at a specific angle that they knew would maximally catch the light. So when you go into these spaces, it is a sensory overload because everything's designed to catch the light perfectly and to overwhelm you with uh, this, this total <laughs> sensory experience. So imagine this, and then you have the chant, and you have the incense, and you have the processions. Uh, that, that was the liturgical vision where all of that was integrated as really a complete um, a total art. That's at least what the, the philosopher Hegel called it, like a total art. Yep, yep. And and I tried to imagine what it would be like for a farmer coming in from the fields mm -hmm. who has no experience with you know TV or yeah. or a or even a book, and yeah. and seeing this, it must have been just. It was like they were dumbstruck. In my book, it's kind of a crude example, but it was the only one I could come up with, is that I try to think of it as like people from the 1950s going to see a, a 3D movie. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a totally new experience for them. So. <laughs> this is, oh, Saint-Sasson Saint in France. This is Romanesque. Mm-hmm. I, I I like this. I I love the Romanesque. When I was at college in Berkeley, or when I when I graduated with my BA, I went over to France and mm -hmm. I went to all of these Romanesque cathedrals, which are not as touristy as the the Gothic. But yeah. I I love the Romanesque. Um, and there's the reason I put this here is is there is an aspect to this architecture that is very unifying with what was going on in the East. So mm -hmm. still at this point, we are have a, a unified, uh, well, I don't know if I'd say unified, but a, uh, a, a world Catholic, you know, culture yeah. that we're still seeing here. So. Absolutely. What what I like to say is, you know, we call it Roman S because it's what happened, you know, after Rome, but so did Byzantium. So even though the Eastern Roman Empire is still the Roman Empire, it did go through, you know, traumatic cultural shifts. So I, I really do see what was going on in Carolingian France or um, uh, uh, Gothic Italy it, before the before what we think of as Gothics, like when the uh, Ostrogoths ruled it was still a unified post-Roman culture to where someone in France could understand the art, the architecture, and the religiosity of someone in Constantinople when this was made. There wasn't that dramatic cultural separation. We still kind of lived in the same um, world, really, this post-Roman world that really wasn't fragmented until a couple centuries afterwards. Yeah, and I have to say, from the point of view of the worshiper, Mm. the the sensory experience that in the roman this is very lit up at this point mm. but romanesque tends to be more dark yeah more mysterious it it feels more eastern in its sort of mystical presentation as as contrasted with the um the uh gothic this is what's greece hagios loyokos i can never pronounce those so yeah. this, yeah, so this is, uh, again, a more of a out-of-the-way place where the early um, um, iconography was, was preserved. Mm -hmm. So we went from Sicily back to Greece, and we're seeing the same sort of aesthetic. Yeah, I, I believe this was actually built more or less in the same time period as the one in Sicily. Uh, the I or the the decorative schemes are not as rich, but as I understand this particular building, it was built in devotion to Holy or Blessed Luke, not Luke the Apostle, but who was a monk. So this was more of a monastic context. But they had you know just tons of pilgrim, which justified this huge, massive building but what i would point you to is you know the the decorative scheme is a little more sparse than what we saw in sicily but we have these massive fields of gold backgrounds and it was really at this time what we would call the middle byzantine period where that having that 
tremendous gold background became the norm. And what scholars believe was happening is this was right at the birth of what we would call hesychasm or a spirituality of the divine light. So this is, you know, maybe a century after um, St. Simeon, the new theologian who wrote all about his experience of the divine light. So that was starting to um, come into being expressed in the visual arts themselves, where you'd enter these spaces and it wasn't just this sensory overload of color, but now it was a sensory overload of gold, which was representing symbolically the divine light. And that's really the shift that starts happening in this middle Byzantine period. I love it. It's very, very well preserved. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I hit too many buttons here. Uh -oh. This is, okay, this is St. Mark's in Venice. Uh -huh. Yes. Very, when I first saw St. Mark's in Venice, I was like, whoa, this is like Byzantine. This is yeah. not this is not Western. I mean, from the layout of the church to the decoration, profoundly Byzantine. And um, it, it still amazes me today, that church. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, so St. Mark's or, or the Venetians are an interesting lot. You ask a Venetian, they won't actually admit to being Italian. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> what Venice is, is the old Byzantine imperial capital of the province of Italy was in Ravenna. Yeah. And when the Goths kind of destroy the place, they fled out into the marshes and founded Venice as a, a refuge. So they always saw themselves as not really connected to Italy, but connected to, to the East. And eventually that turned into a rivalry that went, you know, horribly wrong during the Fourth Crusade when the Venetians, uh, with the help of the Franks, sacked Constantinople. Um, and they took back a lot of the treasures from Constantinople, and that's where this building uh, comes from. So it was literally built out of a lot of, you know, stone from Byzantium. I, on the exterior of this building, there's a, a porphyry carving of the four emperors that actually was taken from, from New Rome, from Constantinople. But this building itself was designed after, we believe, um, the Church of the Holy, po Holy Apostles, where... Um, the Emperor Constantine was buried, that it, it no longer exists. So we think this was designed after that. But if you know any of the the churches in in Constantinople, it, you know it's immediately recognized as really drawing on that that experience. Yeah. Now here's the Hagia Sophia, the famous Hagia go. Sophia. I tried to get an image without those big. Islamic medallions, I can't. Yeah, yeah. So they're kind of hidden behind the call. <laughs> I did a presentation once, and I just went on Photoshop and took them out. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, um, um, Constantinople is now Istanbul. And it's a mm -hmm. Islamic, it's a secular Islamic country, more or less. Yeah. But and so they have covered some of the religious imagery. Some of it is still. I haven't been there in person. But some of it still exists. But again, this is a blueprint where we see in the the West as well uh, a sort of universal Christian uh, aesthetic language. Absolutely. Yeah, this is still. I mean, this is still Roman. So basically, what this building is demonstrating is the architects, and I forget his name at the moment. My memory is failing me. Uh, but he basically combined two Roman conventions together. He combined the Basilica, which we turned into an early church building, but it really was a governmental building. And he combines that with a round domed building, which was more used for a religious context like the Pantheon in Rome. And what he was trying to do is with the combination of both of them and the addition of the side arches, you can make just an expansive interior space. This was the largest interior space in the world until uh, the the modern St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. But this feels to me a lot bigger than St. Peter's. I mean, St. Peter's is big, but this just feels expansive because of what the architecture was doing that, mm. you know, when you went into this building, it really felt like you were floating in light was wow. the, the whole, you know, purpose of the, how this was designed. But it's, it's very much still Roman. Yep. Okay, this is um, 
So now we're getting into the Gothic period. I'm oh. taking up too much of your time. I'm going to try to go faster. <laughs> but now we're getting into the Gothic period. Yes. And um, architecture is different. And also decoration is different. This was kind of a another project of mine when I was in college. Um, mm -hmm. You start seeing the Last Judgment in the West. Mm -hmm. um, of, oftentimes with gruesome detail with the damned um being carried away into hell by uh demons and mm -hmm. so there's a very different theology in the west that begins with the gothic as opposed to the very um how do you say it? para paradis yeah. in in the east um so here here we go <laughs> here's when they start diverging <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So a lot of things were going on here, and at the West, what we think of the Roman Empire in the in the West, actually stopped being, you know, Roman, a really a Mediterranean civilization, um, almost before the fall of Rome. You basically the upper crust of Roman society were all Goths. The em the last Rome Roman emperor, I think, was ethnically a Goth. So what happened is we had this huge cultural shift where a lot of the ways. Christianity was expressing itself uh, was really suited to a Greco-Roman and a Mediterranean mindset to where you could reliably assume that the audience that the art was directed to understood things like a longing for paradise or a paradigm of the divine light where you couldn't really assume that with these Goths who are just moving off of the step and had a very different lifestyle, didn't have the same philosophical, you know, culture to come with. So we get a simplification of the gospel to where, you know, maybe even like in its most bastardized form in, in contemporary Protestantism, like it's heaven or hell, like make a decision, you know, uh, that's, that's where we see that. And that's not necessarily wrong, like it is heaven or hell, but that became the, the, the main note that this art is really focusing on in its persuasion. So it's definitely leading by the stick and not necessarily by the carrot. Yeah, it's it's the emphasis. Um, yeah. Oh, I did it again. <clears throat> At, Aton, I think this is at Aton Cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, here we're getting very gruesome. Yeah. And um, we, we, people also have to remember that when, you know, the, People think the the Roman Empire what fell in four seventy six, but I mean in the West it it did, in the mm -hmm. East it it flourished. So yeah. in in the West you have, I, I hate it. I hate the term the Dark Ages or the early Middle Ages, but I mean things were a lot rougher in the West than they were in the East, and um, that's reflected I think in the art and in the theology a lot of times is that. Uh, life was very difficult <laughs> to say <laughs> no i i agree i agree <laughs> not that it was paradise in the east but it, it was different yeah here's a tone again it's one of my favorite with the hands yeah. ripping the head off and these these demons um very 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 depressing um very depressing very um, this is the tympanum, the tip of the, I can't remember now, that, the tip, tip, tympanum, tip, tip, whatever. When you walk into, uh, um, this is at Aton Cathedral, when you walk in to the Gothic or Romanesque church, you're greeted by this tympanum, which is mm -hmm. above the door, the main doorway, and you walk under this, and usually it's, a last judgment scene and mm -hmm. yeah you have the the demons weighing people um the, the like the picture i showed you before the hands ripping off the guy's head very very um severe message mm -hmm. here um yeah. not not one of i don't know i don't know how to to word it it's it's not so much a salvific image it's it's very much of judgment it's it's very much of heaven and hell and damnation it's mm -hmm. so again you got to look at um a farmer coming in from the fields and mm. this is this is power this is i better do what what 
I need to do so. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's there's an idea in art history where that that's part of what's going on here, but a lot of people see in this something more of a a catharsis, a way to express sort of the brutality of life in in a way that is actually healing. Um, so one way to look at this is like, oh my gosh, you know, I, I'm I'm sure there is, you know, a little peasant lady taking her three year old and saying, see, you know, like pointing at that, <laughs> like you better. But there was also an aspect of going, you know, life is really rough, and this yeah. was vividly expressing, you yeah. know, this stuff is serious. But on the other side of that door is is salvation, is is a, is a, a foretaste of heaven. So. I think it can be both, both and, but it definitely is expressing a, a much more coarse uh, psychological state than what you would be seeing in the East. Yeah. I attach these, these images in progression because I see this as an outflowing of that yeah. mentality of, of damnation, of authority. And, and you know, I'm later going to, hook this into the papacy mm. but you know a certain power structure that needs to be very much um followed this is michelangelo's the last judgment in the sistine chapel and in the west you see a real crisis and and i think part and parcel of that i think it does flow out of the gothic and some of that that uh, imagery that you see before of the of the judgmental yeah god of of damnation you know what jumped out at me immediately when you put this on as compared to the last two is notice too like the centrality of of bodies and you don't really see that in the byzantine art where the body is is never objectified in that kind of way so like when you see those initial gothic carvings of damnation it's it's all you know naked bodies in agony and then you get to michelangelo naked bodies in ecstasy and then now with the last judgment a combination of both but i just noticed that's something very striking that you you wouldn't necessarily see in the christian east in a sacred context i mean there's there's some frescoes of holy fools and, uh, you know, the dendrite saints or the, the saints that lived out in the wilderness who would be, you know, partially nude, but there's not really an emphasis on bodies in, in agony or ecstasy that you, you definitely see in the Gothic and then moving on to the Renaissance. Yeah. This is the Eisenheim altarpiece. So this is Northern European. Um, against, again, this sort of tortured um, yeah. brutality sadomasochistic kind of i i'm not a fan of of this artwork or this yeah. type of artwork um it's it reminds me a bit of of mel gibson's the uh, passion of the christ it's a bit unwatchable it's mm -hmm. in the west you had the pagan roots uh, i have this theory that you know rome was a pagan a pagan city before it was christian constantinople was more or well not more or less constantinople was founded as a as a christian city so it mm -hmm. didn't i mean like you said it definitely had a roman point of view aesthetic but it mm -hmm. didn't have the the pagan baggage like rome did so i i think rome roman aesthetics go western go in a different direction and again, it's it's this emphasis on the sinful nature and uh, of humanity and the torturous results here on the mm. the, the body of Christ. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So you you definitely never see anything like this in 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 Byzantine art. Um, just vamp off of maybe sort of where is this coming from? You know, the, the Romans never, the Romans disvalued suffering. So they thought, you know, people who undergo suffering, it's it's because of weakness. So they would have never depicted anything divine being associated with 
anything like this. And that was actually scandalous to, to early Christians trying to evangelize Romans as they couldn't conceptualize the idea of a suffering deity. That was nonsensical. But that wasn't the case in Gothic paganism. So in Gothic paganism, one of the main gods, uh, you know, this was a paganism that was really built around the idea of gore and suffering. So Odin, for example, you know, plucked out his own eye to get wisdom. And he, of course, was hung on a tree. And that's how uh, sacrifices to Odin would be made. The offerings would be, you know, killed and hung on a tree. So there was this a, a much more glorification of suffering for its own sake in, in more Gothic and Germanic paganism. So some scholars see that as where these kind of images ultimately are rooted. So so the image of Christ's suffering on the cross, we, we kind of have that in the East, but it always says, you know, king of glory on top, and we don't really draw attention to the suffering. That, that really did change in the West in the 800s, and we can actually pinpoint exactly where and how it changed. It changed with the the dynasty of Odo, um, who basically became Holy Roman Empire and was trying to uh, become a rival of Byzantium. And what he did is he appropriated all the previous imagery of Christ, Christ on the throne, Christ as regal. He appropriated that for himself. Uh, there's actually a book about this, like the introduction of the, the a gory cru crucifixion scenes in Western art. And what we think was going on is it was a way to basically dethrone Christ visually and politically to where now he was depicted as as a sufferer and the population was you know okay this is what you should expect because now it's odo and not christ on the throne so before that in byzantium they'd they would obviously depict emperors on the throne but it was always christ and throne and odo kind of appropriated that iconography and then that's where we really first see this this iconography of the suffering the suffering christ yeah. Um, I, I forget the name of the book that explores this, but it's a very interesting uh, historical thesis that happened there. Yeah. If you see, one of the things that strikes me about this painting real quick is you see these these multiple thorns that sort of yeah. pierce the body. And it reminds me of the, the, the modern fetish for multiple sort of piercings. And mm. it, it's, it's sort of, it, 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 to me, it's it's pe pagan, it's fetishistic. It mm -hmm. um, it doesn't strike me as particularly Christian or religious. Um, people can disagree with me, but yeah, I I have a hard time <laughs> uh, interacting with this image uh, just because there also was a shift in the piety as well, where you know passion or focusing on the passion of Christ, which is part of the Eastern tradition, but it's always sort of shining in the light of Pascha, so to speak. But in the West, uh, there was a whole new piety that came in, you know, in the 1300s that fo focused exclusively on the suffering of Christ, where you saw salvation, you know, not so much in the resurrection, not in Christ's destroying of death, but Christ, you know, paying the penalty for sin. That was where you put the emphasis, the soteriological emphasis, and that manifested in the piety and absolutely in the art. And, and you have the rise of, of the flagellants at this time too. And yeah. to make this point again, I don't think that Western Christianity ever really fully um, exercised their pagan roots, mm -hmm. where I think because you constantly see them incorporating paganism into the imagery where you don't see that in the East. No, the, the, I think part of it too is the East sprang out of a living pagan culture. So it had to really vet the paganism out, it, particularly like the in the theology. You know, it didn't appropriate pagan philosophy because pagan philosophers were still around and they had to be very careful about what was Christian and what was not. That's what all the councils were about. Whereas in the West, I think they falsely kind of saw paganism as a, as a dead thing so they could appropriate, you know, everything, you know, okay, appropriate all of Aristotle and Plato, like don't weed out the good with the bad, appropriate all of the pagan art like happened in, in the Italian Renaissance. And I think that was, um, 
<laughs> a mistake. <laughs> like it, it, it wasn't as selective as what happened in East, which was a very long and careful process. Yep. Okay. This is this is where I think the West goes off, and mm -hmm. I th I think you see it er earlier in those those images of sort of gross uh masochism yeah this this would be this is parmigianino mannerist mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. i actually think you see the roots of sort of a sadomasochist aesthetic mm -hmm. in in western religious art and you also see the roots of pornography yeah so, sorry <laughs> sorry westerners <laughs> no no i did again coming back to that that approach to the body <laughs> um an interesting side note, we know historically that it was very fashionable to have these Madonnas painted, but if you were a wealthy, you know, Italian uh, aristocrat, you would get the Madonnas painted with the face of your mistress. So there was a pornographic uh, element in particularly Madonna de Leche, which is a, a, an icon of the nursing mother, um, but we know for a fact, art historically, that that was often your way to depict your <laughs> your mistress. Um, so there, there was kind of funny business going on, and you could probably see this as mannerism, you know, progresses. Uh, it gets much crazier. Yeah, and I was, I was reading, I think it was Saint Justin Popovich the other day, but I mean, he and I, you know, Orthodox, you know, the Orthodox talk about this a lot with the filioque and the innovation that that introduced into the West, and I mm -hmm. think you you see that in art forms as well. Well, it, where it becomes very innovative, and yeah. when sh once you go down that road, well, there's no stopping it. It just can go in all sorts of different directions. Yeah, absolutely. With uh, um, okay, this is Saint Ag. Saint Ag I, I, I think I, it's, I think it's Saint Agatha. Saint Ag mm -hmm. People will correct me. So this is, but this is kind of the culmination of Western religious art, where it mm. just, it, where it becomes clearly S and M. Yeah, and you don't see anything like this in the East. No, I mean we do have martyrdom scenes, but again, they're very Gra not graphic. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. I mean, it, they are they are somewhat, but they're not. I, for example, like a, what happened in the Renaissance is they were trying uh, by influence by paganism, trying to present these ideal human forms. So anytime anyone's nude, it's going to be an ideal human nude that you know is obviously sexually attractive. So when you're doing a martyrdom scene those two kind of things just collide and it does become you know this this masochistic kind of thing where you don't see that in the east when you see even nudity in martyrdom scenes the the iconographer is not trying to depict this you know ideal um beautiful and um erotic <laughs> you know image of the human body that's being tortured it's just you know an old monk or or you know, a, a virgin martyr, but there's never this this instinct to to sexualize, which is, I think, the difference. I would argue this is not even a religious image. It's it's using a religious vocabulary as mm. an ex as an excuse mm -hmm. to create to create pornography, mm -hmm. and that is something that really went wrong in the West. Yeah, I think we're all still living with it today yeah. Yeah. and i think it's theological yeah. and I, I think it's also aesthetic i think the like i said i think the pagan roots in the west were never fully exercised and i think theologically um it went crazy now this this is an interesting image bernini's the ecstasy of saint Teresa of avila um mm -hmm. i went to go see it in rome it's like in this quarter out of the way church and nobody cares and nobody goes and sees it but mm -hmm. I, I've always been uncomfortable with this image. It's technically superior. I mean, it's, Bernini was a master. Yeah. I have a hard time again with where religious art in the West 
went. I think it became innovative. I think you see pagan roots and it, it starts to drift into pornography again. So, yeah, Bernini is really best when he just does actual pagan <laughs> themes like <laughs> I, I forget which one it was, but it's really good. But it's obviously like an erotic pagan scene. Uh, this, I, I think you're exactly right. And you'll have to remember, too, that there was a whole brand of Roman Catholic spirituality that had eroticized the relationship with Christ. And that became part of, um, particularly like in, in the Carmelite spirituality. So blending these two realms was, you know, already in vogue. And there, there's so many things that could go wrong about <laughs> blending, you know, um, spirituality and eroticism. So when I first learned, when I first saw this image, you know, my art historian uh, professor was like, yeah, we all know what's going on here. Like, cause it's, it's, when you look at it, it's kind of very obvious. And even the angel, mm -hmm. he, he looks like Cupid. So in pagan mythology, Cupid would stab someone with his arrow or shoot them. And they'd have this like erotic, you know, orgasmic experience. And that's exactly what is being depicted here with the saint and the angel. Um, she just is, is in a habit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, and I, and I think that you can't deny the, the West, the ability that you see there among the artists, but I think the subject matter is problematic within a religious mm. context. I, I, and here is Botticelli's The Martyrdom of St. Sebastian. And even the roots of homoeroticism are mm. in Western Christian art. Again, sorry, Western. <laughs> oh no, that's that's something again. Art art history has explored in depth. So a lot of these Saint Sebastians were definitely homoerotic. Uh, even Donatello's, uh, not Michelangelo's, but Donatello's David was homoerotic. He had the feather kind of caressing into the buttocks of, of David and it was basically produced um you know for the upper crust of Italian aristocracy who'd basically been uh given over to to homo homosexuality and that was definitely the case in the Vatican. So um that's something really well explored um in art history that that's that's actually what's going <laughs> that's what's going on here. That's why Saint Sebastian was such a a popular figure Botticelli again I would say the same thing he was best when he was like openly just painting a pagan theme you know yeah yeah the, with like the birth of Venus yeah and yeah. and see I don't find this type of religious art mm. uplifting or edifying I don't mm. I can appreciate the the skill I mm. can appreciate the craftsmanship um you know, if I was so inclined, I guess you would appreciate the, the the figure and form of the model, but I don't find it spiritually uplifting. Yeah. In in defense of poor Botticelli, he did have something a con of a conversion experience, and he he wound up burning a lot of his old paintings. So maybe you know this one missed the burn pile. Um, but, but at he, least, but he's right. not an odd case. There's Western yeah. art. No, 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 absolutely. The absolutely. canon is full of stuff. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Okay. And you didn't need to bring up Caravaggio. So. <laughs> so what happens? This is Poland. Um, Chestahoa, um, our Lady of Chestahoa, which is essentially an Eastern Orthodox icon. But I, yeah. I think the end game of Western art is essentially the the desecration of the image. And and here you see it. I, I really can't find any parallels in Eastern Christianity. This is Catholicism here. This is Roman Catholicism. Unfortunately, if you look very hard, you might, but it, it probably is would be coming from very secularized uh, centers of, of the orthodox world but really what you see here is like the like you said the end result of a very long process of sort of secular um secular meaning secular motivations basically deterritorializing or or, or uh, terraforming the sacred so 
you know, that's what happened in the Renaissance is, you know, secular themes basically were flowing back into the sacred arts, taking over the sacred arts, desacralizing the sacred arts. And this is, you know, the, the veil is kind of fully revealed here where, you know, a sacred image has been completely taken over by uh, an ideology. And that's, that's the end. That's the end of the process, really. Yep. Here we go. Madonna. Yeah. People, Catholics were shocked about this this following week, and I'm kind of like, you guys have been doing this for centuries. What, you know, <laughs> you know, come on. This is kind of the yeah. point of this whole thing. Yeah, um, yeah. This is nothing new in in the Western Roman Catholic context. Yeah. And she has she's been doing this for a long time. This is essentially a 40 year old image here. So mm -hmm. she was doing that sort of stuff in the 1980s. Oh yeah. With with like a prayer. And and I think what Madonna has revealed is that I think she does does repeatedly uncover the pagan the pagan roots of Roman Catholicism that was never fully exercised mm -hmm. in in the church and in the imagery. So Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we've got, uh, this is quick, I'm almost done. Here we've got Russia, I can't remember. This is a very early example. I think it's 10th century, 11th century mm -hmm. um, architecture. So here, as in the West, there was kind of a, a universal vocabulary. Um, you know, this is very, very typical of what you would see in, you know, the Mediterranean yeah. uh, Christian Christian yeah, Milia. If it didn't have the onion dome and just had a, you know, a normal <laughs> yeah. dome, it would look, it wouldn't look out of place in Serbia. You know, it's the same, it's the same art, artistic or architectural vocabulary. You need to get the snow off. So that's why those domes were shaped that way. You're exactly right. And here is the, this is a uh, contemporary um, mm -hmm. um, sacred architecture in Russia. This is the, um, Oh gosh, it's, e it's in Ekaterinburg. It's where the Romanovs were martyred. I can't forget. Mm. I can't remember what they call it. But this is this looks ancient. Yeah. Um, but it again, it draws on the uh, the vocabulary. It didn't go off the rails like I, I was thinking of, like the cathedral in Los Angeles, which is like oh. a which is like Bauhaus, <laughs> like about yeah. it's a Bauhaus nightmare. Yeah. yeah. So it. In the and I'm not glorifying the East and say they've done everything right and you know, yeah, yeah. but I'm just saying they I think they're more online with tradition than 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 we've gone in the West completely crazy. Well, it's it's something you've noted several times. This like what happened in the Renaissance is you you started getting different artisans competing for patronage, which is kind of always the case. But how they were competing is basically novelty. So whoever can push the envelope of a theme, who can ever push the envelope in, in technical proficiency, develop new techniques, who, who can ever uh, basically get a, a wealthy aristocrat to want to compete with the other wealthy aristocrat and buy their work as a way to show off, it, it basically fueled this engine of novelty which you don't really see in the East. So you do see changes. Like that's why, you know, as someone, you know, steeped in art history, I can look at something and tell you when it was painted or built and where and what were the influences. So there's certainly changes. There are certainly new things. There are certainly, you know, a competition of, you know, trying to technically outdo, you know, previous generations of contemporary, you know, artisans. But there was never this fixation of, of novelty for novelty's sake which means you kept a very consistent visual vocabulary that's always intelligible to the later generations. They can always, you know, understand the visual language, uh, whereas that's what happened in the West is you you get these massive shifts just for the sake of novelty where you have things that just don't, you know, they're unintegratable. They're, they're in complete discontinuity, um, which is, you know, what, what eventually happened to the, the Roman church to where now you have like church nasiums and, you know, they're not even good Bauhaus. Like, you know, I I would take an actual Bauhaus, you know, 
concert hall over you know the the cathedral of la any day <laughs> you know what i mean it's just like uh, man it's it's kind yeah. of yeah and you've seen the trajectory in roman catholicism yeah. from the secular world like if you look at madonna mm. catholic to lady gaga catholic yeah. where she she adopted a lot of those themes but pushed them again and that's what yeah. you were talking about novelty so this stuff is not dead it's still going on here's andre rublev so yeah. you know profound piece of work very much uh you know indebted to that christ in saint catherine's monastery much later but again you just said it and uh, you just said it about the there's a there's not a static quality to the east this mm. is completely revolutionary and different from yeah. what we saw at saint catherine so it's there isn't a sort of lethargy or you know stagnant quality to the east that i think people think there is yeah yeah i mean that that's that's the misconception so when i tell people what i do they think you know i'm as an iconographer i'm just a copyist and it's just like well no the tradition that's not how tradition works tradition is always moving in two directions it, it's traditio traditio means to hand on so it's always going forward but the content that is handed on is what you know is is passed down so tradition is it's not static. So here we do see Rublev. What he's actually doing is introducing contemporary currents in late Byzantine iconography, the Paleologian, what's called the Paleologian Renaissance, which is really, in my opinion, like the high point of Byzantine iconography. And he's bringing that now into Russia, but using a much wetter, much more Russian technique. But it's really that same high Byzantine aesthetics. So, I mean, this was this was shockingly novel to his viewers, but it still has that direct continuity to where I can look at this image and that, you know, image we started with the catacombs and it's still the same visual vocabulary. It's still the same iconographic tradition. So as an iconographer, I'm not like, you know, I do a lot of copies of, of old master works because that's how you learn, but I'm also very interested in what contemporary iconographers are doing and what the new currents are, you know? No, so, so it's always... You know, it's always ancient and new at the same time. And that's really the great thing about being a traditional artist. Yep. And then this is where sacred art, specifically in Russia, mm. went, which is really interesting. This is Victor that's not um, mm -hmm. one of my favorite. So, I mean, he's really gone in a in another you know another direction but it's again you i mean repeating what you just said about the rubla it's it's yeah. there but but so different so new but so familiar and so traditional and so beautiful yeah. and i love it i love this period of russian art i'm actually crazy about it and here i love this image i think it's saint sergius and this is uh, a mikhail nestarov Mm -hmm. Again, very, very indebted to tradition and to the past, but yes, uniquely Russian. I just I love the the solitary figure and the stark sort of Russian background. But yeah. if you look at the image here, it's very iconic. And I, I had a professor at Berkeley that used to use that term, and he used to drive me crazy because I, I didn't know what he meant. He never defined it. But yeah, yeah. and I went to the the graduate student instructor, and I said, what's she talking about? And she's talking about a certain, like, iconic form of, like, an yeah. icon. And this is just from the position of the hand and the gaze. It's very, but it's very unique, and it's very new, and it's it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> yeah, the, the Russian Impressionists were really the best. <laughs> the landscapes are fantastic, but even the figural paintings are, are really great. Yeah. yeah. So this is, it's it's sad. So we've seen the two yeah. progressions or regressions of liturgical Christian art mm -hmm. um, from its beginnings and where it diverged in the West and the East. Mm. And that was kind of the point of this exercise. Uh, yeah. Thanks for going along with me. I, I took yeah, way, sure. way too yeah. long. Can, can, yeah. 
that's okay. I'm I'm gonna give you a tough question. Mm. Can can you give us kind of a profound statement or something about <laughs> what I mean, I kind of I think I kind of know my theory about what happened here. Mm. I, I, I think I think the art and the aesthetics in the West started to diverge around, you know, 1054. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, you see it really take off in the Gothic. I mean, I've been in like Chartres Cathedral. Yeah. Uh, what's that other one? saint Chapal in Paris. Mm. It's a very different experience. It's all windows. It's all light. It's it's certainly grand. It left it, but I don't have the same sort of experience that I have in an Eastern or Romanesque church, which is, which is very. It sort of gets into your soul and your skin. Yeah, it's that dank. I don't know if if always in France the Romanesque churches were a bit abandoned and they were dark and dank and and I just felt it much more viscerally mm. than in the Gothic. The Gothic is very sort of. I don't know. They always left me with kind of a a hollow feeling. I I don't know. It might just be me. It's what I'm, what I like, and what I'm drawn to. But I, I think there's a richness in the East in the artwork, and there's a purity there. But there's also a very profound sort of religious religiosity there where it doesn't start to feel secular like it does in the East, in the West, it, it remained pure. It remained true. Yeah. That's, that's my little, there's, that's my little spiel. Yeah. What, <laughs> what I, what I actually think is going on in general is, is really what you're identifying the, the transition between the Romanesque and the Gothic. What made that possible was a pointed arch uh, that they got from the Islamic world, and that created a way to not have heavy masonry, which means you can put windows. Well, as soon as you have windows filling a space with light, uh, what happens to the symbol of the divine light? It becomes overly naturalized. So now a fixation on how nature is depicting the divine starts to just displace an iconographic depiction, which is always, yeah, it's this, it's, it's an analogy, but it's always very different. Mm -hmm. So even though we use the analogy of light, it's light in those heavy built, you know, Byzantine churches, it's light flickering out of candles. It's light radiating from the gold and radiating from the faces of the saints rather than light shining through a window on real bodies and real space. So I think that's what it was, the shift. It, It was a shift away from the iconographic depiction that always had a, a deeper noetic element. It always says this is an image, but what it points to is always well beyond that to a natural depiction that says this is a mere analogy and there's like this direct correspondence. And I think when the divine started to become captured by our ability to capture it with reason, with technology, with techniques of architecture and art craft, it basically cut the link to the divine to where the divine was subsumed in the secular and then you get rationalism. So I think that's actually what happened. Uh, We moved away from this symbolic iconographic world into a naturalistic world. And as Nietzsche says, um, it was only a matter of time before you kill your God off when you do that. Awesome. You should really teach an online course. And I know you've got five kids, you've got a wife and you've got your own life. But but an online art history course would be really good because what you're able to do, which I have trouble with, is you're able to um, intermingle or um, interweave, you know, the art, the philosophy, the theology and all those things. And I think because I don't think people know that they think that art is kind of over here, philosophy is over here, theology is over here. All this stuff is kind of going on in their own little spheres, but it all intermingled and it's all, we're kind of all living in that today. And that's really good. Oh yeah, it's all connected. I will point out that I do have a whole lecture series, but only Byzantine art. Wow. But it's it's uh, it's on YouTube. If you want the actual course, because I did design it as a course and it was used by a pre-seminary program in the Eastern Catholic world. Um, if you want the whole course, you'll have to email me, but the lectures at least are up on YouTube, but it's just Byzantine art. It, it doesn't go into 
a Western art at all. I'm going to listen to it. Very minimally. But yeah, there's like, goodness, like 16 lectures on my YouTube channel on that. That's pretty much all that's on my YouTube channel at this point. So in the in the show description for everybody, I'll do the the a link for the article that I referenced mm -hmm. and also for Raymond's YouTube channel. So I'll do both of them writing it down. Sorry yeah, so, to start sorry to keep this so long, Raymond. No, that's, that's okay. If you get me started talking about art, I'll just just show me pictures and I'll just go and go forever. So there's no problem. <laughs> I love it, but I learn a lot from this discussion with you. And then a lot of stuff I remembered that, you know, my professors at Berkeley had mentioned. So I was like, oh yeah, I remember that. But it's been it's been so long. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Awesome. Now, do you, awesome. do, you do you sell do you sell your artwork like panel paintings or oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So um I, I take commissions. Okay. I do you have like just a handful of icons that I've, I've already done that are for sale, but I, I definitely do commissions. That's like my main source of income is commissions and uh, teaching iconography online. Wow. So. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Raymond. All right. Good deal. Nice talking to you. You too.